Good morning, everybody. Uh, it's February 16th, 11.04 a.m. This is the Assembly Enterprise and Utility Oversight Committee of the Whole. Madam Clerk, would you take the roll? Mr. Constant? Here. Mr. Cross? Ms. Dern? No, Mr. Cross is Here. excused. Ms. LaFrance? Mr. Presbardia? Mr. Peterson? Present. Ms. Quinn Davidson? Mr. Rivera? Present. Mr. Salt? Here. Mr. Sweet? Here. Mr. Voland? Mr. Voland is also excused. Ms. Salatel? Here. You have quorum. Ms. LaFrance has just arrived. All right, everybody, we have a pretty packed agenda. We have two standing unfinished items, discussion of the port plan and finance. Probably we're gonna be bringing that back here pretty soon. There's been a document shared with the legislature that we should brief and discuss and the Aklutna River Restoration Project. On that note, tonight from 4 to 6 p.m. in this room, we'll be meeting with the native village of Aklutna, and I'm sure that will be a topic of conversation there. Also on the agenda under new business, we have an introduction from the Equity Committee. I don't know if they're here. We also have a briefing from AWWU on the Asplen Wastewater Treatment Facility Disinfection Systems. Hopefully an update on the Heritage Land Bank from Mr. Wilbur. I should have asked him if he was coming when I just saw him. And then a discussion on snow hauling contracts. Then other standing items, you have stormwater utility update, legislative priorities, and budget items. Uh, is there anything members would like to add to the agenda? I don't hear anyone, but I see that Mr. Robbins is here. Did you have a specific item you wanted to brief? Thanks. Okay. Um, anyone else? Hearing seeing none, no objection. The agenda is adopted. We will move right into the equity committee report if there's someone here. Mr. Chair, I don't think someone is here just yet, but I will let you know if they arrive. All right. We may come back to this item next. Mr. Corsentino, you have the floor. All right. Thank you. Uh, I'm Mark Corsentino. I'm the general manager of Anchorage Water and Wastewater Utility. I have here Dave Persinger, who's our o &M director at the utility as well, and Jeff Axman is our treatment director sitting in the audience. <clears throat> What we want to talk to you about today is our um, disinfection facility at Aspen Wastewater Treatment Facility. This has been on the, we've had a few item, purchasing items on the agenda as of late in, in an urgent request manner, and we want to explain why, how we got here, and what we're doing to mitigate that. So with that, you know, what I want to do today is talk about, again, give a brief overview of the plan for some of the folks that haven't seen that. There's at least one new assembly member I see here. Um, explain some of the operational challenges with the disinfection system particularly, um, and explain the the time sensitive critical nature of the, some of the recent requests and some upcoming ones as well, which we were going to kind of talk about a little bit in the last item. <clears throat> so for those that you haven't been there, um, Aspen wastewater treatment facility is the largest wastewater plant in Alaska. Um, it began operations in 1972 with the clean water act. Um, it's a primary plant. Um, and we'll get to that in just a minute. The, it was upgraded from 28 MGD to 58 MGD in the late eighties because of the, growth of Anchorage, but we only still operate at 30 MGD. Um, in course, the, you know, briefly, um, acronyms don't serve. So MGD is that million gallons, oh, a million per, gallons day. per day. Sorry Thanks. about that. Yep. <clears throat> oh, I'm glad I can see it over there. That hurt. The uh, Congress added the set, the 301 H provision in the clean water act in 77, because when 72 original clean water acts went into place, they required everyone to go blindly blanket lead to secondary treatment, but it was unnecessary for environmental reasons for a lot of ocean outfall communities. So there was a provision that was added in 77 to go to the primary treatment 301 section. We've gone over that in the past, but if for those that have more questions and information, I'm happy to elaborate on that at a later time. Um, as with a lot of EPA permits, they take time to get. The first time we actually got the permit for the 301H was in 85. It was reauthorized again in 2000. And then they're five-year permits, but EPA can take a long time. So we submitted it again timely in 2005, but we've been on an administrative extension since then. And as we are currently going through the permit reapplication process right now of updating the stuff that was done back in 2005 with scientific studies, one of the more important things on this uh, bullet point is that la the AWU administers an ex extensive marine monitoring program as a permit condition. That will be one of the items we talk about today because that's one of the um, contracts that we need to get updated um, in the next month. <clears throat> okay, so just as a brief uh, 
high level overview of primary treatment. Uh, we screen all the solids. Uh, Assembly member Cross got to see this firsthand last about a month ago when he came and visited the plant. Um, those solids are screened and landfilled. The, the, then it goes, the water that passes through the screens is then settled out in clarifiers. Um, the solids are removed from the bottom, um, thickened, dried, and incinerated. The clarified effluent then goes to disinfection, which is what we're going to talk about today. And then it is discharged to cook and let after chlorine contact time is met. So, and this is just an overview of that chlorine contact time and where and how the disinfection system if, or the effluent eventually makes its way out to the ocean through an outfall um, 800 feet off the shores of Cook. And that kind of by uh, Point Warns Off Drive. I mean, there's it's a kind of an area, a public use area by there's a beach, a little road that goes down there, but that's further out, out there is where our outfall is. There's an old tower there that's oftentimes graffitied, it probably still is, that is uh, actually in use and that just backs up the water to make sure we get chlorine contact time to kill pathogens. So disinfection by its very nature is a mandatory process of the wastewater uh, treatment process. It's, tar it's for targeted destruction of pathogenic microorganisms. It's, it's a requirement. Um, and our permit requires it. So the way our permit works is you, again, acronyms, but 850 fecal coliform units per 100 milliliters is our limit. We can't exceed that um, on a monthly average. And then, but on the flip side, we can't over chlorinate because chlorine, chlorine is toxic to fish. So we also cannot exceed 1.2 milligrams per liter of total residual chlorine. So you're fighting it on both ends. You have to have enough to uh, target and kill pathogens. Oh, thank you. But at the same time, you can't over chlorinate either. Um, and for what it's worth, the disinfection, uh, which I didn't define here, it's the next slide. Well, actually it is, is the targeted destruction of pathogenic microorganisms. The way the United States almost holistically disinfects is through chlorination, whether it's water and wastewater. There are other ways, uh, UVs, um, chlorine dioxide, there's other methods, but they're all have their strengths and weaknesses and chlorination is by far and, and the most useful because of economics and effects, effectiveness, quite frankly. <clears throat> Um, and the disinfection buildings there in the bottom of the plant that you can see, which, um, which I showed there. Now, so chlorination, there's a number of ways to even do chlorination. Uh, the historic way we use it was chlorine gas. Um, and these are all, those are pictures of chlorine ton cylinders. Those are extremely dangerous. You had to go through uniform fire code, uh, risk management plans, uh, community right to know programs. These, these are, these are dangerous. As a matter of fact, you know, you, you, the news recently, there's a vinyl chloride spill, I think it was in Ohio, Pennsylvania, in a train. It's it's a similar type toxic chemical, and it can cause severe damage. In 2007, a train derailment for these types of cylinders killed 12 people and put hundreds of people in the hospital. Um, recently, it, in Jordan, there was another chlorine spill from a tanker, uh, a, a ship in a port that killed 15 people and put um, several hundred people in the hospital. So chlorine gas is... It's effective, but at the same time, it, it is highly toxic and, and can be dangerous if mishandled. Now, we chlorinated for a long time with chlorine ton cylinders, but as I kind of said in the memo that I sent out, we made a strategic decision with various stakeholders, um, risk management groups and whatnot to get rid of chlorine gas altogether throughout the utility. We use chlorine gas not only at Aspen, but all our water treatment plants as well historically. It was the most common use uh, method uh, up through the early 70s. And then it's been replaced by hypochlorite, which will, um, which is what we're doing now. And hypochlorite is basically bleach, and it's fairly simple. But uh, it's it's you add salt, water, and electricity, and you get sodium hypochlorite, which is also it's essentially chlorine uh, disinfection. And there's off-gassing of hydrogen gas, but in small amounts. And kind of alluding to where and 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 the risk is. So that that figure there shows you the theoretical toxic extents from um, work, well, what do I call that? Work. Bottom line, <laughs> that, yeah, and that's actually just at the plant. So what's, what's troubling, as you saw in the prior pictures, is that that causes back in the day is that you have to get the tanks from the, the port, the ships, to the plant. So you have to drive these ton cylinders on, on trucks down um, down through downtown Anchorage into the plant. So this is the this worst case scenario if we had a leak at a plant, but it was far worse than that. I've had to go through Anchorage itself. So there's all kinds of code of federal regulation requirements for risk management plans to always mitigate these risks, but they were still real. All they did was identify how you could mitigate it. But at the end of the day is the only true way to mitigate this was to get rid of it. Um, so in, in the uh, early 2000s, one of our, I have several strap plans in the early 2000s where our, our targeted goal, not just AWU, but 
utilities across the United States were just getting rid of chlorine gas because of this danger. And so we we did it in 2015. We got done, and it was a $19 million upgrade to the plant at Asplund. But it's been an operation. Go ahead. Tina, are we still paying for that? Yes. Yeah. Oh, as in 20 years or 30 years? Well, uh, <laughs> I'd have to look at a depreciation schedule, but Thank it depends you. on the life of the facility. But we had to uh, borrow money, obviously, too. But remember, our finances are a little different than, but to answer your question, we are still paying for that. Okay, so OSG is on-site generation of sodium hypochlorite. Um, it was analyzed uh, extensively back in 2007 when we made the move to be the best, most effective way to disinfect um, from a life cycle cost for operations and maintenance. And as the bottom uh, graph there shows, I don't have a label on it, if we had to go with just purchased hypochlorite, um, it would be spending almost $6 million based on the prices we're seeing now on an annual basis versus what it's costing us to run hypochlorite now is about three and a half. And that's even with some supplemental purchases that we're doing just to make sure we have enough on, on site. So point being here is you don't have to worry too much about the numbers. It is a significant savings over buying it liquid hypochlorite. And that's been proven also. So those, those, that past slide was showing what the, on the 2023 numbers were we, the new prices we're getting right now in our bids, even from a historical perspective, our actual operating costs, it can, it shows you that we've, it's been a significant savings. And the challenges we've had is um, at times, because it is a, a complex system and high maintenance, um, we've had to buy additional sodium hypochlorite at, at high cost at times. And that's where we really get burned sometimes. And you can see that in the columns, like in 2020, we bought half a million dollars worth. We've The recent contract that was uh, the assembly approved was up to a million dollars. Now, that's supplemental as needed. It won't necessarily be something we spend, but I'll get to that in a minute here. Okay, uh, at the end of the day, it's a complex system. And you, if any of you ever wanna come and see the facility, Assembly Member Cross got to see it recently, you're welcome to come in, just let us know, because it does. It will require a shutdown, because even, even though it's um, we've managed and mitigated a lot of the risk of the facility, it still is one of those facilities we wanna uh, take out of service to be extra cautious. Um, when we have our staff go in there and work on it, when it's operating, they wear face masks and pappers. So it's, um, cause there are chemicals in there, quite a lot of them. As you can see on the right, those are just the chemical cells, our chemical reactions, redox reactions for those that like chemistry. Um, you know, the, the, the major equations up there on the top, but there's anode and cathode cells where there's uh, reactions going on both sides of the cells to basically produce hypochlorite and a little bit of off-gassing. Um, and a lot of piping and pieces that, that go into this. Um, but it is, and here's the rub on it because it's a, uh, I, I look at this as like a car battery. You know, if you freeze your car battery, put the wrong um, solutions in there in your cells, you're going to kill your battery. And this is the same, you have to have really pure products because it's a chemical reaction. So it's highly sensitive to all kinds of things. When I say environment too, you generate a lot of heat in this facility um, because you're pretty, you're putting power energy in there to make those reactions occur. And so you generate a lot of heat. Well, heat uh, is not uh, in the wintertime. There's, we don't have a whole lot of uh, the heat's useful, but in the summertime, when we get hot days, we actually have to have coolers and cool the place because otherwise the rectifiers, which convert the DC or the AC to DC to generate this thing, they overheat and we, we lose production capacity. So there's a lot of little nuances in this facility. Um, go ahead. Have you analyzed the value of adding a heat pump, a waste heat, a oh. waste heat sink pump? Because you probably have the land out there, and that we, you know, that uh, we've talked about stuff like that. But at the end of the day, we actually have a contract with Noresco to look at energy efficiency stuff and on a broad scale. That one specifically, I don't think we've looked at. But you know, now you mentioned it, Chris, it's probably not a bad one to look at. You know, and if if I might, the folks at the Sea Life Center have an ocean-based one that might actually tie along with your outflow pipe and create a really good use of that heat in the summer and the cold, the heat, even the heat in the winter. Anyhow, just thought. Oh, appreciate that. <clears throat> um, okay, so go on to the next slide. So obviously keeping this in compliance requires reliable operations, system knowledge and ongoing learning and adaptation. This is one of the first um, large scale, high production bleach facilities. Uh, for uh, water wastewater utility in the United States when we first did this. You know, for us, it made sense. Folks in the lower 48 can buy a purchase type of chlorex because they're not trucking it as far. The factories exist down there. But for us to ship water up here is very expensive. And, and what's noted on that third bullet down is hypochlorite degrades over time. Once you've made it, it goes from, you know, up to 15% down to 
almost 0% over a manner of time. Sunlight impacts it and other things. It just degrades. Those reactions break down. So you have to use it relatively quickly. Um, and and what's it saved our bacon, though, at the same time, too. And, and during the pandemic in 2021, there was a nationwide shortage of hypochlorite just because factory workers weren't working. Um, some plants had gone down because they also are high maintenance. We didn't get affected by that on that front. <laughs> what we've what gotten affected by is that um, we have to get salt. And there's been supply chain disruptions, long lead times, and chemical price increases because of the various ports. You know, on the West Coast ports were threaded. There was a huge increase in the prices and, and lead times. So at the end of the day, as you can see, and, and our, our usage varies seasonally. You know, I guess kind of alluded to that in the memo. When we get higher spring concent higher concentrations in the spring, we have to use my, more hypochlorite. So uh, the system is designed to handle all this. But at the end of the day is we have to take the system out for maintenance. And, it, if, and, and when we're taking it out for maintenance, we have to have storage on site. But we, again, have to manage that storage. You can only store so much on site because you have to use it in a timely manner. So there's, got, there's always an ongoing balance. Um, this is just a, a, a kind of picture of some of the how uh, uh, corrosive some of these chemicals are. These are uh, chlorinated polyvinyl chloride pipe, which is very inert material. But at the end of the day, you can see even that gets corroded in the inside out. I've got a picture for those that may want to see that of some uh, some of that in, in real time. Um, and it's complex piping. You have to, and you know, we have good, we have plumbers and pipe fitters and they know how to weld steel and iron, but when it comes to PVC, it's been a new learning curve for them and it's, it's unique and it's different. So like I talked about earlier, there's all kinds of instrumentation in this facility that has to give feedback loops to shut stuff down, to run out the right concentrations. And those can also pr get premature failure as well. The, but the life of this system are these electrolyzers. That is kind of what I call the battery, if you will. That's how the, that's where the conversion occurs. And that's what we'll talk about, I think in a minute here. Hey, Ray. Uh, uh, no, we're looking though. Can you please mute on the phone? Muted. Yeah. Um, so obviously we need to make sure we have redundancy and that's one of the, that recent contract I remember was, Unmuted. was the, just having supplemental storage of having a contract to buy hypochlorite when we needed to because of unanticipated emergencies, um, making sure that we have the more sensitive equipment and inventory for replacement. So there's going to be some contracts requesting that in the short term and then uh, making sure that we just strengthen the system through what we've learned over is where are the where are the pinch points that we need to make sure we do more proactive maintenance um, because you know one of the things that we've learned is some things that were expected to last for five to seven years we've only lasted for three years or four years in our system because somewhat of learning curves there's a kind of a feedback loop if we've used the wrong salt for instance of course that's going to shorten the life and that has happened so we've learned from that um, and then we just need to make sure we have staff available for the specialized training and. And we need to work with the vendors to get the specialized training because the, the welding of this piping to, and not just piping, but the tanks and whatnot is a challenge. And that picture on the middle there, that's just our salt bay. That's kind of what the, the raw material looks like. And I think, yeah, here's another picture of that as well. So some of the stuff that you've done recently, so thank you for this, was on January 10th. We did the lay it on the table item because we had a salt contract, but it was, well, the, it met specs. It wasn't as pure, you know, and it's one of those tricky things you learn just because something it's I equivalent equivalent to something of us the generic brand at the store versus the higher grade brand I mean some people don't care and buy generic but sometimes there's a difference in this case there was so we had to go with the higher grade salt even though by specs it was almost the same there was a small amount the, the specs required 99.5 percent sodium chloride the stuff that we got met that spec but uh, the stuff that we were replacing it with is 99.9 percent .9 pure so it's just it's it's a subtle difference but we're still looking into that there may have been some other impurities in there that we're not aware of but we're we we went with what we know has worked so we changed that contract and that's why that was there and the stuff has a long lead item we need to have it and it was de it was degrading our, our infrastructure so it was a it was a strategic and important change that we had to make so to go back to a different product Mark, Mr. Yep. First, you know, briefly, um, at 11.07, Ms. Quinn Davidson arrived and Mr. Hearn just arrived. And uh, Ms. Alto has a question. You move so quickly sometimes. So <laughs> I'm actually back a slide. Um, you said staff availability and specialized training. Um, we're asking this kind of of every department right now. Do you have the staff you need or do you have considerable vacancies, particularly with related to the um, treatment plant? We do have considerable vacancies. Um, Specific to the treatment plant at this point in time, no. Okay, so moving along from salt. So and the reason I want to, in the next one will be the hypochlorite now. So we had two items in succession, one on January 10th for salt, which is the raw material which we used to make the hypochlorite. 
But when we can't make the hypochlorite at full production, we also have to buy supplemental hypochlorite. And that's what that was on February 7th, where we, um, it was, it was an op uh, open market procurement, but it was over the $50,000 limit. So that's where we use the emerge provisions because we need that in there because of the long lead items. And we know we have to take this thing out of service. The salt caused the electrolyzers to degrade. We need to replace those, but we didn't want to replace them until we had the newer electrolyzer or the newer salt to make sure it didn't foul those as well. And so that's what this purchase was. Now it was for 1.1 million as well, but that's only as we need it. We're bought, we already made an order of that because we are short but we will not use all that if we don't need to. It's really just there in case we need it as needed. But we also have to recognize if we make an order from this, if we keep this contract in place in perpetuity, we have to consider it's a four to six week lead item, you know, cause they've got to make it and then ship it up here. And that takes time, but it buys us time too. It's essentially a redundant system for us. It, go ahead. So let me make sure I understand what you just said. So the hypochlorite is the product that we make from the salt but you're talking about possibly buying hypochlorite, the solution already manufactured. Correct. Shipped up. Yes. And you're doing the math to see where the best value is. Correct. In, in the heart of the system, like I said, is those electrolyzers, and that's what the picture is you're seeing there. I call them again. They're like electrolytic battery cells, and, and, and they're just reverse. You're putting power to them to generate a, a product, which is hypochlorite. But they're made of... Uh, pretty precious metals, quite frankly, titanium and other things to generate this product. It's that equation that you saw earlier because they, and they again, require pure products, pure salt, pure water. As a matter of fact, our water, AWU has the best water in the world, right? But it has just enough hardness in there that we have to soften the water even. So we even have to make the water pure. Otherwise it'll foul those membranes in there. So they're expensive. There's 16 of them total. We have eight on standby now to replace eight of the 16 that are there now, once we get the new salt, which by the way, we just got it the other day. So thank you for that. Um, but these things are extremely long lead time and expensive and they, they're supposed to be five to seven year life. The first batches we've got three to four years. So, you know, we're not quite there yet where we need to be. Um, we're still troubleshooting and figuring that out, but that's not out of the range either. You know, it's just like a car battery. You can get it five, seven years out of a car battery, but if you mistreat it, you'll get two to three years, if, if even that. Not saying we mistreated it, but we're learning. <laughs> so, but, but at the end of the day, we also want to make sure what, what's coming on the assembly, as a matter of fact, on the next assembly meeting, I think this is not, this is on the assembly meeting for the seventh. Is that the next assembly meeting? Um, hold on. I have it written down. Oh, that's right. This, the February 21st meeting, there is an item on there, a, um, I wrote it down because I want to make sure you for these purchases. So we there's going to be a purchase AM 90, 92, 2023, 10 Delta 7 on the 221 meeting for the, this purchase. And this is an extremely important purchase because we need to have these on standby to replace them if they go bad for whatever reason. And um, we have eight on standby to replace, but that doesn't give us the full capacity. So that's why we have that supplemental purchase in case we need it. We still may meet near full capacity this summer. But remember that we don't, uh, it just depends on the d demand that we, that, of how much we have to disinfect. Again, well, like I said earlier, oftentimes in the summer, we have to use up to 4,000 pounds a day when on average we use less than 2,000 pounds a day. It's just seasonally uh, variations. So that's coming up um, next meeting. And then a uh, future request, there's a, a, a brine tank. So when you make salt, uh, you have to put it with water to make brine and that, that has to get mixed appropriately at the right levels. And that goes through a brine tank. And that thing has been in operation since 2016, but it's now failing and degrading. So that's a long lead item that's going to be coming up uh, along with a, a, a brine header replacement. And so once it goes from the tank, it goes to a header to go to those electrolyzers, all those stuff over time from 2016 on that's been in operation have started to degrade severely that they need to get replaced now. And they're, again, they're long lead items. So that don't have an assembly date on either one of those. I'm not even sure. Well, I think those both will need assembly action at this point in time, but at the end of the day, they're coming and we'll give you a notice of that. So the if there's no questions on disinfection, I'm going to jump off to just the permit at large because this is another important thing since I have your attention. Um, the next meeting, I think on March 7th now, there's going to be an item for, I talked about in the very first or second slide about how we have a marine monitoring um, program that we have to do as part of our permit conditions. That contract has been in place since about 2000, when we first got the permit renewed in 2000, 
the first year of the contract was in 2001 to do have this outside uh, scientific agency come in, not agency, consultant do a marine monitoring program. They've done it every year since 2001. And we've kept the same body because they have to generate reports to the EPA every year in this manner that talks about what we do to our system. And it's, it's the same body every year. And the agreement we've always had is, as you can see, it's amendment number 18 now, 20, 20 some years later. You know, the first contract was in 2001 with a five year extension. So 2001 to 2006, it was a big contract awarded to these folks for five, up to five years. We've ad amended that every year since then because we wanna have the same body on board for the knowledge as we go through the permit renewal process. When we get the new permit, we'll go back out in the street again. But until that time, we want to keep the same consistent body because they've got the right team and they've got the knowledge that we need to make sure that we go through the permit process with the right folks in history and knowledge. So that's coming up on the March 7th meeting. I don't have an, I just approved that through on base today. So we don't have any numbers yet, but that's coming because that contract ends at March, the end of March. So that'll be a must pass item. Um, with that, I'll open up to questions. First question for me, Mark, is <clears throat> when do we anticipate the permit renewal? Right now, it's a good question. Um, well, first of all, there is, EPA will tell you there's no guarantee it's going to get renewed. Obviously. Yeah, yeah. but the permit reapplication and draft permit process, it has to go through the federal designate, uh, federal stakeholders, National Marine Fisheries, among others. But that we're anticipating to have a hopeful draft permit by 2025, 20, late 24 to early 25. It takes that long. So and, and by draft permit, you mean a record ready to submit for review, not- yeah, They'll go out to the public for review. Yeah, not something sent back to us with a tentative approval. No, if they give us a draft permit, it is a tentative approval. Oh, it it would be, okay. and, and but but we haven't got to that decision point. There's a lot that's gonna go on between now and then. Right, no, I'm aware of this, but for the members, what happens if we don't have a permit? Yeah, that's a huge financial hit to the municipality as a whole. Um, right now with escalating price increases that we've seen recently, that's a at least a one point four billion dollar upgrade, if not more, by the time that comes around. That was and, billion with a B. And it's worth noting what I always say is we want to do the right thing. Our job is to safeguard the public health and the environment. We want to do that. And this permit does do that. Uh, and then the provisions in place. And we've we've made that case and I think we can successfully make it again. But at the end of the day, if if it doesn't, a far be it for us to get in the way of not doing the right thing, you know. So, but we we can show that, and that's what all the work is we're doing right now. And the most important thing to, to take home message for me, since you gave me the opportunity, Chris, whether you intended to or not, is look. Even if we there are there are parameters like PFAS is, is is a huge issue. It's not fully regulated yet, but we know that's in our wastewater. If there's things like that that we know that are in there. If if they are hurting belugas or anything else in the environment, we can target those out in other ways. We don't need to go to secondary because, as a matter of fact, secondary won't take care of those issues anyway. So to blindly go to secondary at 1.4 billion dollars is a hurt to community for no 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 benefit. There's other ways we can mitigate any risks that are out there through our wastewater if they exist and are shown to be harmful to the environment. I think you used a term of art, secondary. Secondary. Oh, oh I'm sorry. That was a term of art. I think secondary treatment. Yeah, meaning. We are a primary treatment facility. That's the 301H waiver to secondary is the state. If we were to lose that permit, we would be forced to go to secondary treatment, which would be the one and a half billion dollar upgrade. Right. Thank you. Anyone else questions? Ms. LaFrance and Mr. Next. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just to comment, um, thank you for the very detailed information and the really great presentation. I think another member, maybe it was Ms. Zalatel at Tuesday's meeting, had made a comment that um, even though the request was expedited, yeah. um, I shared that same high level of comfort with it because you know you always provide so much detailed and helpful and understandable information. It's really um, easy to understand you know why something is important. So thank you, Mark. You're welcome. Thank you, Ms. Dern. Actually, uh, thank you. I just wanted to echo that. Um, I wanted to say that the detail is amazing and I'm learning a lot. Um, and I just wanted to, I, I might have been asked when I shut my phone off as I came in here, but um, on the slide where it says the 2007 alternatives on yep. analysis, Correct. Yep. Um, I'm just wondering, I, I see we have 2023 estimated cost up, updates for the chlorine feed rate um, and, and uh, for the hypochlorite. Yep. I'm wondering on these other uh, possible methods, do we have any updated information on those? Have any of them come down in cost over the past decade? Uh, it's a good question. Uh, even if, I, I don't think so. Sodium, uh, let's see, I'm looking at those. 
So what we did is we made the best uh, alternate, like one of the ones that we could have actually worked. Chlorine dioxide, in my mind, is a very good effective uh, disinfection as well, but it is so expensive and challenging, far more than what we've gone to. Ozone, uh, that's that takes a lot of energy, and in, in for a primary plant, that's a tough thing. Ozone is very common in water, potable water. UV doesn't work in wastewater very well. Well, I take that back. Let's. <laughs> UV actually we do use for disinfection at Eagle River because it's a very, the effluent there is, you know, 99 point, we get, get rid of 99% of the turbidity, but it's a much smaller plant and it has dairy, very different permit requirements simply because you're going to a river estuary versus a marine estuary and not to make it sound like that's, that's a separate conversation for another day, but there's a good reason for that. So the end of the day is no, Oh, the last two wouldn't be effective anyway, in my mind for the type of wastewater we're discharging. The other ones, those costs have all gone up as well. I mean, the hypochlorite alone uh, the, uh, to buy that would just kill us. And so we've seen those. The only other one that could be even close would be using the much weaker strength, but then we're going to use a lot more of it. And so it's going to be a similar scenario. And honestly, to go through another $20 million upgrade would not be good for us. This is a very effective tool and it's the best we came up with at the time. And it's actually proven to be the, the most effective. Thank you. Anyone else? Hearing seeing none, you are off the hook. Thank you. Have a good day. Next up on the agenda, we're going to, if I don't see Mr. Wilbur here to make a presentation on the Heritage Land Bank, it might be our dropped ball and not making an invitation. No, that's not true. I don't know. <laughs> the, the invitation went, okay. uh, went to the municipal manager as well as um, to Mr. Wilbur. Okay, so um, that's why I said it might have been because <laughs> my memory is fuzzy. Um, <clears throat> Anyone here from HLB? So this underscore is an ongoing issue that we're having. Um, I don't know if you had an opportunity to read the ADN editorial from the folks in Girdwood who've proposed tree houses, yurts, and outhouses as the future of their housing stock in Girdwood as an alternative to Holton Hills. So tree houses, outhouses, and yurts. When we when yeah, when we get HLB online and in order, I look forward to having a, a rational adult conversation about all of these things. Yeah, tree houses and outhouses. So, just visualize with me for a minute. Next up, we have a discussion on snow hauling contracts. Um, I am apologize to the individual who asked to be heard. I did not get everything printed for folks to have. There's just too many emails for me to sort through and figure out what was germane. But that said, uh, we would be glad to welcome you up, sir. Come on up and take a seat with the microphone and we'll go ahead and start a discussion and take your input on this this issue. Uh, no, right over here, please. Just any one of these mics. Please state your name for the record. Yes, uh, my name is James Baxter. I'm with Northern Gravel and Trucking in Anchorage. So you wanted to be heard. Now's a great chance. Give us three minutes. Tell us what your thoughts are, and we'll start a conversation. Sure. Uh, I guess first thing is first is that the assembly approved a, a snow haul contract supplemental for Northern Gravel back on February the or January the 10th, and until the article came out in the newspaper about McKenna brothers uh, illegally pumping fuel out at Northwood station. I had no knowledge that they were running supplemental trucks for street maintenance. And after the approval of my contract, my understanding is that any additional trucks that were needed that Alaska pro truckers couldn't provide was supposed to come through my company and not through some amendment that was done in Eagle river through the RRSSA in Eagle River, um, which I don't think, I never seen any approval by the assembly for the, an amendment for those contracts. Um, so that's you know one of the reasons I'm here. The other reason that I'm here is on the Alaska Pro Truckers contract, the original contract, there's some ethics uh, reports and stuff that they're supposed to supply to purchasing, they're supposed to uh, file these seven days prior to the bid date 
uh, the information I got from the city clerk's office that they provided to me, this information wasn't provided until two weeks after the bid date. It wasn't um, signed by Dan Zepay's supervisor. It wasn't signed by purchasing and returned to the clerk's office like it should have been. Uh, information that I got from Michelle over in purchasing was that she could never obtain this information through the mayor's office so she could you know, sign it and return it. And so I'm wondering why was Alaska Pro Truckers awarded that contract in the first place without the proper paperwork where Dan Zapay, according to the state filings, is 100% owner of Alaska Pro Truckers and he has no employees. So Zol uh, Colby, his son, they say it was all turned over to him, but not according to the state filings that they're on file currently. And, and I come here, to, you know, to try to let the assembly, like I said last week, to, to do something about this regarding my contract with that I have. And we're not being called for supplemental trucks when other companies are being called out there to provide supplemental trucks through other contracts that don't even pertain to street maintenance you know, and, and give the assembly a chance to do something about this, or otherwise I'm going to seek legal counsel and bring suit against the municipality for this. So any questions you have, why I'd be happy to answer. Ms. Quinn Davidson, go ahead. Hi there. Hello. Um, thanks for coming. And I guess just to put a little context on this, you know, really our job is to appropriate funds and it's the administration's job to effectively and, um, you know, legally uh, do the contracting and effectuate all the work that we sort of put through in our policy vision with the budget. So I think we're in a bit of an uncomfortable situation um, meddling in the in this level of, of detail. So if people are sort of unsure what to do, I think it's not for lack of interest, but it's not really our position. That said, with this administration, we have had to do a lot more of that work because um, there have been you know, there's been error after error. Uh, maybe error is generous. Um, uh, maybe intentional. I don't know. So anyway, I, I think just for the members, if you're, you know, we, we keep hearing of all these problems, it, it's hard to know what to do in our role, but we do appreciate you voicing it. And um, we hope that you don't have to sue the municipality. And that's a sentence we've said too many times in the last couple of years. Mr. Peterson. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so, so are you telling us that there's trucks available that are not being used for hauling? That's correct. I, I have a supplemental contract that was approved by the assembly on February the 10th. And any additional trucks that Alaska Pro Truckers couldn't provide was supposed to come through my company and not go through McKenna Brothers, who um, I'm not aware of any contract that's been approved by the assembly for street maintenance for them to provide trucks. And they're providing them through the Eagle River RRSSA, which I've, I've heard there was an amendment done to that contract. Like they'd done two amendments to my South Golden View contract for me to run road graders for street maintenance back in December. And, you know, I've heard testimony that the assembly or the, the city manager says there was no amendments done, but I have two amendments that was done to my contract and they were signed by the city manager. Well, uh, so, you know, if, if there's additional trucks that need to be used, how come I'm not being called? How come McKenna Brothers is running their trucks with no contract? Well, you know, the, the bottom line is there's a lot of snow to haul. And, and if there's trucks available, we, we, they need to be figuring out a way to use them because we're getting calls from neighborhoods that have the need snow to be hauled. And they needed it to be hauled weeks ago, not not tonight, you know. And and so um, it's good that you know you were letting us know about this uh, because we, you know, we know there's a demand for for more hauling out there. And, and uh, another thing I want to bring up that right quick is I was contacted by Paul Van Landerham, and in my contract it says that my contract is not valid unless a purchase order is issued. I have text messages from Paul and saying that he wants trucks out there. And I said, I, I called him and I says, well, how about my purchase order? So he sends me a text message, he responds. He says, well, the purchase order 
is being emailed to me and I'll get it to you shortly, but I want 10 trucks in the morning and I want 10 trucks Monday through Friday. You know, then we show up out there on a Monday morning with the trucks that they, they asked for and they send our trucks home after we had trucks, people that drove in from the valley to haul for them. And then we get sent home and until still to this date, I've never received a purchase order from street maintenance and we've hauled for them for several days. I haven't received a purchase order, nor have I been paid for the trucking that we've done for them. So <clears throat> I have two thoughts. No one else is in the queue. Um, one, I know the answer to this question, but it's a question that has to be asked because I think you essentially answered it, but I want to put a point on it. Like us, we didn't know there were a number of these potential adjustments being made <clears throat> until well after the fact. Um, when you submitted a bid, there's a seven day window to file an issue with the bidding review board. If you have a complaint related to a contractor, like if there was a process not fulfilled by purchasing, some element wasn't appropriate in the purchasing procurement process. Did you have an opportunity to file a, a request to the bidding review board? Uh, and which contract are you referring to? Uh, that's relating to the issue of a potential conflict or forms not filled out properly in, in advance of a bid. Uh, I, I wasn't aware of any of this until a lot of the problems arised out of them not supplying enough trucks. You know, what, what I understand was until the supplemental contract came out, I didn't know they were having big issues with Alaska Pro not providing trucks, but... So According yes, to I'll Jim. just jump in quick. That's a separate issue. The question of trucks provided, right, but, but, but really the question of the bid and not being properly, potentially not being properly filed. And I think the answer was you didn't know, so you didn't file. No, because there was a there was a there was an, another bidder that actually was low bidder before last pro, and they waited a time period for that, and then I think that bidder decided not to to, to go forward with their right. bids. So then it was awarded to the next bidder. Right. Okay. So that's a. a due process issue that probably your attorneys will have to review and think through. And then, um, so I received from you a number of documents and one of them was a potential contract amendment in December. And I forwarded it off to the municipal manager with questions and their response back was this contract was never signed and we determined it wasn't necessary for them to do the work outside of the hillside service area. And so I would welcome, if you sent it to me already, send it again, the one that has the manager's signature on it, because the one I received doesn't have a counter signature on it. Okay. Because we, we did do work for the, under that amended right. contract. No, absolutely. Did the work. I, I have a disagreement with the administration on the question of whether the work was allowed without an amendment. I believe you cannot be providing services awarded under uh, LURSA or Subversa or any of these other organizations if you're doing it in ARTSA. But they argue back, no, we can do it. And so they did send you the amendment. I saw that amendment. And then Correct. they state that after they sent it to you, they made a decision they didn't need it. Therefore, it's not signed. I would love to have that signed copy if you have one. Doesn't mean the work is invalid. Yeah, because what what I have from them is they sent me this copy of this amended contract and asked me to sign it and send it back to them. Right. And, and that's what I did. But then you probably from what they tell me, they didn't send you back a signed double signed where the Munim manager Correct. I didn't it. receive anything yeah. back from them signed. Right. I just got a, an email back from Maury Robinson saying, you know, Jim you follow the directions under for Paul Van Landerham on supplying him the graders that's needed for street maintenance. Yeah, that's accurate and I think helpful information. So um, I, I'm not sure where we go with this, but he asked to be heard. Uh, okay, Ms. Alatol. Thanks. I think my follow-up um, with the, um, and I wish the municipal manager was here, um, is to ask um, the municipality to kind of map out the sequencing of their services for snow hauling and snow plowing this winter. I think it's been terribly confusing. Um, we've had the issue of utilizing um, the Subversa contract as an extension into the ARTSA and just really having a law laid out. Um, we did get a small, like we got a table and it had the burn rates, but it doesn't really talk about how these various contracts are sequenced. Um, and so I'll make that request. I mean, I'm making it now, but I guess I'll have to also make it in writing since there's no one here to uh, take that request from this meeting. Thanks. Other members? 
So um, I see in the back of the room that there's Mr. Zappay is here, Colby, not Dan. And I don't know who's next to him raising his hand. Um, Yeah, so Mr. That's yeah, not. I get it. Thank you. So Can I say quick something as he's coming up? Oh, yeah, I'm not sure we're going to have him come up yet. Oh, okay. Um there's a gentleman in the back who's been emailing us in relationship to snow storage and ordinance and so I I just didn't know he raised his hand. So, um I don't know that we need to hear from you Mr. Zapay. I think if you want to be heard, you can only because your name was brought up, but I don't think we need to at this time. Your call. And if you're going to speak, come up to a microphone. Okay. Okay. Oh, can I just say something while he's coming sure. up? Sure. Um, when I was speaking earlier of the administration, just to be clear, I wasn't speaking of Paul. Paul's been here forever think he, he's a good actor and he's doing his best. So yep. I just want to make sure that was really clear. Yeah, it's hard to have to keep saying that because our words often get taken out of context. But number one, have so we gone after the hardworking public servants of this municipality? Mr. Zappay. Um, I just, uh, I, I would agree with Jim. I think there's been a lot of confusing uh, things going on with these contracts. Um, the supplemental contract has made it 10 times more confusing for all of our subs pretty much everybody involved. Um, and, uh, and, and the fact that he was called in, um, and when he was called in, we had the number of trucks that we were required that we were requested of. So I don't know why he was even called to begin with. Um, I don't know that there was overlap between the McKenna side dumps and, uh, the supplemental contract the McKenna side dump started mid December. Um, so and they worked through January. I know. I don't know at what point they quit. I think it was. It was after reported that. to me just a minute ago that they were a phalanx of McKenna side dump trucks moving through town an hour ago. Yeah. Um, I'm not aware of that. Yeah. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, I mean, as far as contract things, I mean, um, I mean, I, one of the issues that I had was that uh, when Northern Gravel was called, I mean, our trucks were pulled off of our job you know, and sent to work for a supplemental contractor. And, and that was one of the issues that was brought up. I think Mr. Cross brought it up in the, uh, um, the day that it was approved, um, that there's supposed to be a list provided by the supplemental contract of the trucks that they're supposed to within like three days of the contract award, they're supposed to provide a list of the 30 or the 15 or 30 trucks that they're going to use. And I think that would have established some sort of boundary. Um, whereas like, okay, these are, primary contract trucks and these are supplemental trucks now because now we're in like this weird competition thing and you guys tried to uh you know make the rates equal that would have um you know would have made it an even playing field there wouldn't be this conflict this this uh competitive thing going on um but it's just there, there's a lot of conflict here and to have two com competing bids doing the same job in the municipality again, brings up a lot of legal things. Um, so it's like, I, I don't know. And I know that you guys have limits to your capacity. Yeah, and I, I would say it's not competitive. I'd say it's anti-competitive because literally the government is putting out a contract to increase the rates for a supplemental contractor. And there's no boundaries around that. So why wouldn't the trucks that are hauling for the primary contractor go to the supplemental to make more money. And that is literally just simple cause and effect, basic logic that is not calculus and hard thinking. And so I don't understand how our government has moved into a position of anti-competitive operations, but we, here we find ourselves. And so, okay, I think probably for now, we'll end this conversation. Um, know that we are paying attention. It's on our dashboard and we don't yet know the answer. There are many questions for you still Mr. Zappay, and also from you, Mr. Weber, we're looking forward to figuring this out. Um, I don't know how we'll approach this, hopefully, um, this snow issue. The spring will eventually come, and then maybe we can sort out the, the bones afterwards to find out where the bodies are. But um, it's going to take us time. I'm sorry that it's so confusing and it's a mess.
Yeah, I, I've made a request through um, all of these different departments, which I'm sure you guys are aware of the, you know, how requests go on, on deaf ears here within the Bronson administration. But I made a request for any invoices, trucking reports, or anything that McKenna Brothers had been hauling for the municipality. And I've got no response from anybody. And I sent this email chain out to, you know, Maury, to Paul, to Eric, to Jim Belts to, to ask for these records. And I've got no results at all. And I guess the only thing I have would have to do is be to take it to court and get a subpoena. So um, I would recommend or request if you could in one email and maybe in a table, put together all the requests you've made and the status fulfilled, unfulfilled, responded so that we can see what you've asked for. But again, I can't have it in 10 or 15 emails because I just can't manage the information. If you can do that, that'd be very helpful for us okay. to understand the ignored public records requests that have been made by members of the public to this administration. Um, and any reporters, when you get that list, there's more fodder for your effort to bring light into these places. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Um, and then we have no additional items on the agenda except for the standing items. Um, do we want to entertain briefly a conversation about the snow storage or just wait for Tuesday when um, we have that item on the agenda? Uh, Mr. Sweet? I think at least a brief discussion of it because for me, and I, I've mentioned it before, but for me, I was very surprised. You're, you're referring to the item on the Tuesday agenda that's been kicked back a couple times now? Yeah. To me, I saw that item on the agenda the first time it was put forward, and I thought to myself, oh, well, this will just pass with flying colors. It's to help with snow storage. It makes perfect sense. And that was a month ago. And we've had, what, a foot of snow, something like that since then? So I think at least a brief discussion on that, gauge everybody's thoughts and, and where they're at. I'm in favor of it, have been from the start. That's how I voted. And I'm just kind of wondering what the, the wisdom of the rest of the body is. So we have about three or four minutes. Ms. Quinn Davidson. Um, just quickly, I was no, going to. Actually, I'm sorry. We have seven minutes, eight oh. minutes. That clock's um, Just going to respond to Mr. Sweet. I sort of, you know, anecdotally, I guess, or not anecdotally, without a lot of information, I guess, conceptually felt the same as you. But then we were receiving reports from folks that there's plenty of stores, storage space. So I think it's. It's more about the facts that are confusing. I think, of course, this body will ensure that we have places to put snow, but do we need the places? Um, and that's the part that I've been struggling with. Mr. Sweet. Yeah, conditions on the ground, unfortunately, have been very rapidly changing. And I have been told, uh, totally anecdotally, that some of the information that we received about those snow sites not filling up turned out not to be true and that some of those sites did end up having to close and for all I know are currently closed it, it they close for hours at a time then they open back up and they close for days at a time um, so I know it changes rapidly but to my understanding the, the way I see it is it comes down to if there's something we can do about it I think we just need to do it it's something to my understanding that's been done before that was the point that Mr. Cross had made um, but to your point, it, some of those sites did end up having to close because of the amount of snow we ended up getting shortly there, including very shortly after we were told they wouldn't close. Request, if Ms. Zolotel were here, she would tell you because she's so detailed about these things. She did make a very thorough request of the administration to provide us with a factual briefing on capacity, location, what's going on. And so I don't recommend holding your breath but we have requested that that be presented to us. And um, yeah, or even on Tuesday for any length of time when we open the public hearing and the debate. And so um, just for folks, if there's no one else, I have an amendment that I've drafted that I'm working on that would allow snow storage sites, but it would be by resolution of the assembly, not by executive decision. And so, um, that would mean on any given day we could set a special meeting when they come forward with a proposal that says this is where we've determined would be the best site for potential new short-term temporary snow storage. Um, it, it would take away from the administration the ability to exercise discretion by finding lots less than 30,000 feet and leave it with us to make those calls. The only discretion that would be left with the administration would be to narrow 
the flexibilities that would be allowed on any given site, not to expand them, because we're the ones that ultimately are going to hear from members of the public when there's a snow dump that goes up right next to an elementary school or, you know, in the heart of a residential neighborhood, because there's this random lot that somebody wants to put in the queue. And so you'll see an amendment coming around that will address that. Ms. Quinn Davidson. Oh, okay, Mr. I'm sorry, I missed you. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to say that we have uh, three people here in the audience who uh, are in the snow business, so the snow hauling business. And I mean, anecdotally, it might be interesting to just know how they all feel about this problem. Right. I think the best use of that time would be on Tuesday when the public hearing opens, um, only because we just have a couple minutes left in the meeting. It wasn't on the agenda and it is important. And we are hearing from folks by email, but the public hearing is set for Tuesday. So the only thing I would say is that I encourage you to come back and, and bring other people that are in your industry. The more voices that are heard that night, the better. Ms. Quinn Davis. I was just going to add that, um, isn't it correct that the action that we're being asked to take would waive all the typical land use requirements around selecting a snow dump site? Effectively, yes, it would. It would allow the department to make a review. And if um, primary conditions that are in the ordinance are met, then it would be allowed. And so again, that's why I think one last check is important. And that check is us, not the mayor. Yeah. And just um, maybe for newer members, like as you're thinking through it, one of the biggest sort of controversial items lately in West Anchorage has been the siting of a snow dump site. Yep. Uh, a lot of environmental concerns, a lot of folks who don't want it in certain places, how will it impact vegetation? So it is something our communities, uh, in my experience, care about, um, which also sort of gives me pause. Not to say that if we need it, I wouldn't move forward, but those are the reasons that I've been less, less enthusiastic than it might seem like conceptually we should be. Uh, it's it's waste, it's solid waste. And we're talking about waiving the requirements for where solid waste decisions are made to place in our community. And while people think about it as pretty beautiful snow, it also moves PCBs and other chemicals and needles and knife blades into areas that might have residential uses very nearby. And so it's not something to do lightly. But that said, it's not necessarily not something to do. We just have to maintain the proper checks. With that, we'll have time for a member of the public who wants to be heard. Three minutes. Now's your chance. You're welcome. Please state your name for the record and set the clock. Yeah, my name is Colby Kelly, and I just came to talk about the AO 2023 7 snow dump ordinance. I just wanted to express uh, the situation that I feel like on any given day, our last option could be shut down for good it's already being uh, we're experiencing one to two hour waits on a regular basis last night at 2 a.m we had 15 trucks hauling for us and they were sent away at 2 a.m um, we were told this morning that they can come back however we drove by before this meeting and there's a dozer blocking the entrance and there's a line of trucks waiting to get in again we set these trucks up to haul for private properties our customers are experiencing just they don't know. We can't tell somebody when we're going to haul their snow because we don't know if the snow dump's going to be open. We set up truckers to haul in between snowfalls and then we get the snow dump shut down. You know, they're hauling from East Anchorage and then they sit at the snow dump and wait for one to two hours. It's just not an effective, cost effective option for Anchorage. Like I said, we still have no options that I'm aware of to haul side dump snow to except for a Klutna. So, I have a handful of properties that are large enough to support side dumps. We use those because they're more efficient to haul than end dumps. And those trucks are all hauling to a Klutner right now. I think that we're any given day that that one snow dump that we have open, the O'Malley snow dump that he told you has lots of room, has ice roads that they count on. At any given time, it's going to get warm. Those ice roads are going to be not effective and we're going to have zero options. So I don't care if it's, approval that comes from something that the administration has to uh, approve or if something that you guys can come up with the after approve all i want is extra options it's just ridiculous to me that anchorage is in this situation where we can't haul snow within the municipality 
in a in a town that's in Alaska. So that's really all the input I have. Um, I've been doing the best I can to just be professional and voice my concerns. Um, I've asked people that work with us to voice their concerns as well. And I really don't know how else to go about being effective on this issue other than just showing up and hoping that we get some relief. Um, we don't stand to gain anything other than being able to do our job and being able to tell our clients that we're doing it as cost effectively as we can. And quite frankly, there is a lot of properties that we haul from downtown that have no place to put snow. They want us to haul the next night. If they, if we don't, they have no parking. They're very adamant that we get their snow moved. And so today, after I leave this meeting, I'm going to send an email to all my clients and just explain the situation. You've been paying way more than you need to because of this, of the weights and we are being shut down periodically and there's times in the, and I just don't know if, if or when we're going to be able to haul your snow. So I've been encouraging them to, if they want it hauled, give me approval so I can get it done whenever I have the opportunity. And if nothing's pr approved, then there's definitely, I anticipate a time this spring when they don't have an option to bring it somewhere. Thank you. We're out of time for Thank this. You. Thanks for your testimony. And this item will be before us in our next regular meeting. Anyone else? I think we're out of time. With that, I would ask for a motion to adjourn so we can get on to the budget. We are adjourned. Thank you, everybody, for your participation.